This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We're going behind the scenes in this episode of Real Talk. Welcome to the show. Ryan Jesperson here with you. John Hicks as well. In just a second, Calgary's Mayor Jody Gondak. Uh, Just a few days ago, it was Friday. This is now a Monday. I know people will listen to this uh, any day of the week at any time. But the point is, Calgary's Mayor Jody Gondek met with the organizer of a petition calling for her recall. They did it late in the afternoon at the end of the week, which meant that a lot of people were left wondering, how did it all go? What did they talk about? And ultimately, what's going to come of it? Well, Dr. Jody Gondek, mayor of Calgary, is going to join us to take us behind the scenes. And we'll reflect on what got to this point, how she and they got to this point, and and ultimately where this whole thing goes moving forward. I suppose it may be uh, you control what you can, you don't control and let go what you can't type scenario. But who knows? We'll see what the mayor has to say about it. Of course, it's our first episode of the week, which means that Charles Adler will also be joining us. An interesting column uh, he wrote over the weekend in the Winnipeg Free Press, uh, Two Wrongs, No Rights, his perspective on the war between Israel and Hamas. Plus, uh, Donald Trump, uh, former president of the United States, wants to be president again, has a very short period of time to come up with nearly $500 million. And if he doesn't, a whole bunch of things happen, including seized assets. This all part of a lawsuit. Uh, Chuck's going to get into that with us as well. I know that's a story that obviously they're paying a lot of attention to down in the United States. And I imagine some of you are wondering what on earth is going on there as well. This episode is happening uh, because of the presenting sponsor of our friends at Rello. Better real estate training starts at Rello. It's Alberta's top real estate school. And well, you may say, well, I've got a few options out there. I've heard of a number of different options. Why choose Rello? Well, number one, they're Alberta's top online real estate school. They're the uh, online learning source for the bold and ambitious. They're the only real estate school that sets you up with a professional practice network, professional development webinars, plus a whole lot more uh, through their community. Say hello to a reward rewarding new career with Rello. Their support doesn't stop once you've written your exam and got your license. They want to see you succeed as your own boss, making and earning your own income, setting your own hours and helping people buy and sell their dream homes. You can knock 20% off any Rello course right now with the promo code REALTALK. That's all one word, REALTALK, when you get started at Rello, R-E-L-O, that's Rello.ca. Well, let's get right to it. Just a few days ago, Calgary's Mayor Jody Gondek met with the organizer of a petition call, petition calling for her recall. We're grateful that she's agreed to make time for us on the show uh, to get into what they discussed and ultimately what she's taking from it. Good morning to you. Hope you had a good weekend. I would imagine you had a lot of things on your mind. <laughs> it was a very good weekend. I got to spend a little bit of time in community and with my family. So uh, thanks for having me on, right? Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate you making time for us. Uh, how, how did this meeting with Landon Johnson come about? Did, did, did he reach out to your team? Did your team reach out to his team? How did this all happen? So Landon was in um, the City Hall building, uh, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And we were coming in from a closed session into Chambers. And I walked past him and he was you know, holding up the petition. He was asking people to sign it and he didn't say anything to me. So I went in, dropped off my things, came out and introduced myself. And he was quite surprised that it was me. Um, so I talked to him and I said, you know, if you just reached out and, and met with me and had a conversation, we probably could have talked about your concerns. This was a pretty big step to take considering we've never even met. And so the next day he reached out to my office and we booked a meeting with him. And uh, so so uh, you'd never met you. You weren't familiar with this guy. This Because uh, I think a lot of people are. Let's get into this. Let me start that question again. Some people are going this. This guy's just a he's a citizen. He's an engaged citizen. He was frustrated with a few things and he set up a petition. And then people started coming out of the woodwork, organizations, individuals, whatever, to help him with this petition. And others are going, no, 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 this guy's all plugged in. He's an organizer. This is all part of some big strategic plan. What impression did you get? I can tell you when I ran into him outside of Chambers and after the meeting that we had on Friday, this is just a Calgarian who is really frustrated with things. Um, Landon Johnson independently launched the recall petition. 
He was frustrated with many things. Uh, we talked about a lot of them. He's got the same concerns I have about affordability of housing and what are we doing to address homelessness. Um, he's just, he's frustrated and didn't know how to connect with council. He tried to register for a couple of public hearings, but um, he wasn't wanting to speak to the topics that were on the agenda. So he was unable to see us. And he thought he's got this tool, um, a recall petition, and he launched it. And since that time, he expressed his frustration that there's people that have asked him if they could help out. And he's getting frustrated that they're trying to take the process away from him. So I would say he's probably in the same place I'm in, which is wondering why um, others are trying to take control away from the individual who launched the petition. Huh. So in other words, he feels like his petition is being co-opted. He does. He's, um, you know, he's appreciated that people have offered to help, um, but he's frustrated that people are trying to uh, scan the signatures, um, that they're trying to make photocopies. And he's indicated to them, please don't do that. I'm responsible for this. And I'm responsible for making sure that this information doesn't get shared in any other way. So yeah, he, he's a bit frustrated with everything that's going on. And he's frustrated at the state of the economy, at so many things that are happening in our city and our province. And he's just, he's a genuine person who cares a lot. Uh, people can check out our March 20th episode uh, with political scientist Dr. Dwayne Brad if they want to learn more or understand more about the people that have become involved in this petition. Uh, Dwayne does a good job breaking it down uh, in our archives. You're looking for the episode Backroom Political Conspiracy Exposed. So Landon walks out of this uh, meeting with you into a media scrum and uh, and uh, you have to assume it's probably one of the first media scrums he's done and, and uh, kind of interesting for him to be taking those questions. Uh, he told reporters he was disappointed that you didn't resign. Did that come up during the meeting? He actually said in the meeting, he goes, I know you're not going to resign, but what would it take? How many signatures would it take for you to uh, present this to council? And I said, that's not how this happens. And so he has this desire to have council vote on whether I should be recalled, which is not how a recall works. So um, we had a good conversation about that. And ultimately I said to him, look, I can tell that you're super frustrated with this legislation. And he said, I am, it, it's got all kinds of flaws and problems. I said, I'm seeing the same thing. So from the petitioner perspective and from the subject perspective, if we've got concerns, do you want to work with me to get communications up to Minister McIver so he can see how this isn't exactly working since this is the first time that it's happening? Yeah, uh, but as a point of interest, we had uh, with Tasquin's mayor, uh, Tyler Gandam, on the show on Friday in his capacity as president of Alberta municipalities. Didn't even occur to me. That was on me. Didn't even occur to me that he's facing recall on his own. He's, and you two aren't the only two. Um, and, and a bit of a different scenario in the smaller population centers where it seems a little bit more doable or, or a little bit more achievable. But do you get the sense? I mean, obviously, <laughs> yeah, we got to consider that I'm asking the question of the person where the recall attempt is focused. But but is the whole thing misfocused here? Like, like at the end of the day, when you started talking to Mr. Johnson about his concerns, did you get the sense that maybe some of his concerns could be addressed in a way that your recall wasn't his ultimate end goal? Or do you get the sense that this feels like something personal to him, that this is about you? Well, he didn't even know me. So, I mean, he chose to use me as the subject of the petition to deliver a message that he was frustrated with counsel. And that's that's unfortunate for me. And, you know, if, if he had come and spoken with me, we could have hammered out what his concerns are. We could have talked about how to best address them. Uh, we could have had uh, some civil discourse like we did on Friday. And so, you know, I'm a little bit frustrated that he chose this legislative tool, but he has every right to do this as well. So, you know, one of the big flaws that I see with this recall legislation is you don't need a reason. You can just launch it because you want to launch it. And, you know, the mayor of Wetaskiwin is going through this. The mayor of Medicine Hat went through this. There's other jurisdictions. Um, the one in Calgary has just had the most focus on it because, it appears that the people that are trying to help the petitioner are much more organized and it's get, getting a lot more airplay. Yeah. What sort of an impact has the whole thing had on you? I mean, to me, it, 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 it feels like you meeting with this guy 
to be honest, is a real positive. Um, I feel like uh, I don't mean to sound cynical here, but let me just say it's a really good PR move on your part. But 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 I but if I know you and I think I do know you a little bit, I don't think you did it just for the PR. I, I feel like it goes a little bit deeper than that. So how has this resonated with you and, and how has this impacted you and maybe even changed your approach to, to what you're doing? It's a really good question. Um, I would be lying if I didn't say that it hurt. Mm -hmm. I would be lying if I didn't say that there's anger and frustration. But at the end of the day, you mentioned this at the beginning, what can you control and what is outside of your control? I can control the way that I feel about something. And in the last couple of weeks, I've chosen to make sure that I'm focused on listening to what Landon's concerns actually are. And by doing that, I was able to start a dialogue. And I think one of, the, one of the big realizations I've had is I'm so busy doing my job. I've got my head down. I'm doing the work. Maybe I haven't taken enough time to explain in plain language what it is that council is doing and how it impacts Calgarians. So for me, it was a very introspective time. And I can choose to be angry about this. I can choose to be, you know, I could have been somebody that came out and um, made Landon look bad. And I didn't want to do that. So this is an opportunity for me to make sure that the way I'm communicating with Calgarians really speaks to what their concerns are. I mean, there's there's people that sign this petition. So obviously, people are upset with things that are happening in the city. And I think if we can have better two-way dialogue, proper civic discourse, we can be better as a city. And I ran on a platform of bringing stability and a positive future to our city. So if I'm not leading in that manner and I'm just leading with bitterness, we're not going to get anywhere. You, you did touch on that uh, in the, a release uh, that your office put out or that, you know, you put out through your Twitter account on Friday, just after that meeting uh, Friday afternoon, you talked about what you ran on. You talked about the spirit of your campaign. You say, I understand that as a mayor, the spotlight is on me to help Calgarians thrive. I, th I thought it was interesting. The one line in your statement, you say, I'm you know, I'm directing my focus away from those attempting to manipulate processes and recommitting toward listening to the voices of Calgarians. That's got to be a difficult step. I can tell you in our in our live chat right now on YouTube, a lot of people are, are referencing some of the bigger organizations that are either alleged to be connected to this or, or maybe just people using their common sense can draw a line between A and B. I see a lot of people invoking Brett Wilson's name here. But how difficult is it going to be for you to step away from this? As I mean, you're a politician. That is your job, right? We're talking about your political survival right now. To be able to re refocus and say to Calgarians, why don't we attempt a bit of a reset here in the relationship? You think it's doable? I think it's absolutely doable. We have to have the will to do it. And if I'm not going to exercise that kind of leadership, then who's going to? So as the mayor of the city, I made a very firm commitment to making sure that there would be prosperity for everyone. And if I get mired down in the polarization that we're seeing, then I'm not lifting people up. So I'm choosing to step away from the polarization. I don't want to be in the middle of debates about, you know, whether this is nefarious and who's involved, because there are much more important things that need to be done in the service of Calgarians right now. So it's absolutely my goal to use the polarization that we have in the world right now to find something good out of it. And if that good is getting more people together and actually having proper dialogue with each other, like I did with Landon, then that's something that I can absolutely control and I'm going to do more of. Mayor, we've got Jillian in our chat here that says, you know, it's very convenient for the provincial government to have mayors distracted by this. Do you think there's something to that? I really couldn't tell you what the provincial government is thinking about this. Um, Minister McIver has been an absolute professional. I called him the day the recall um, was announced and I said, I hope you know that I have every intention of doing my job and not being distracted. He appreciated the call. Um, I've heard comments from you know others in leadership about changing the legislation, but not while this is on the go. So we shall see what the provincial government does. Um, and you know they're talking about having municipal parties. So there's there's all kinds of stuff at play. But frankly, I'm not in an election year. I am here to do a job. I was elected to do this job, and the folks that voted for me and the ones that didn't. My job is to serve them. It's to not be distracted by polarization in politics. So 
I'm uh, back to a place where I have to lift everybody up. That's my job. Hmm. Um, we, we've taken a look at some of the reasons that the organizer lists for this recall petition. And th there's, I mean, they're kind of all over the map. Um, I'm sure that people have checked them out themselves. Some of them, you know, banning Canada Day fireworks. They didn't like your opposition to the premier's parental rights legislation. I, I don't know that kind of that, that stuff. I, I don't know. I mean, what jumps out at me is this theme around there. There's this anger when you joined us on this show uh, the morning after you got elected and we asked your first order of business, you said you declared a climate emergency. You said there's a climate emergency. And then let's fast forward like a year and a half. And then Calgary, certainly not the only city that's looking at things like single use plastics ban. And and, uh, you know, we're talking about bags and straws and 15 cent surcharges and, and things like that. The common theme, of course, is the environment. The common theme, of course, is meaningful action on climate change. Now, I know just as well as you do, Mayor, that a lot of times the loudest voices aren't always the biggest voices. In other words, just because a voice or perspective is the loudest in its presentation doesn't mean it represents the most people. Where do you stand now? As your own council has backtracked on, on, on the pl single-use plastics ban, as there was blowback to the climate emergency statement, which I think you could find a lot of support for across the country, but just maybe not in the heart of oil and gas country. What's that telling you about Calgary's role, about Alberta's role in addressing climate change and issues around the environment? I think your point about loud voices aren't always the majority of voices is a very good one. I can tell you that um, the energy companies that I spoke with before we did um, our vote at council, they were all very happy that the municipality had finally stepped up to join them in implementing the type of measures we need to curb our emissions. So they felt very much like as corporate leaders, they were doing their very best and we were silent. So we have now been in step with our major energy companies and we're doing the same things that they are doing. Um, and we are attracting capital to our city as a result of it. So it was absolutely the right thing to do. And, you know, if we haven't noticed, there's been so many wildfires. Wildfire season is starting earlier and earlier. We are in a drought condition. There are so many reasons to believe that we need to be good climate stewards that, you know, good leaders don't back down from these things because it's in the interest of our citizens. And there's many people at all kinds of community events that will say thank you for demonstrating leadership on this. It's important. And that includes corporate leaders. So, you know, you can't back down because some loud voices are saying you shouldn't have done something. Uh, as of Friday, so as of the 22nd of March, uh, Johnson told reporters that he'd collected about 42,000 signatures on his petition. He needs a, he needs more than half a million to get you recalled, so it's not going to happen. But 42,000, there you go. It at least gives us a number. People have been wondering uh, how successful that petition might be. Let's talk about the flip side. Uh, what has shows of support looked like? People are more inclined to reach out to mayors and talk shows when they're pissed off as opposed to impressed. Uh, but what does the other side of the coin look like? I've been receiving a lot of messages from people that are saying, you know, I'm sorry, this is happening. Uh, please stay focused. You're doing a good job. Um, the, there's people I don't even know that are reaching out to to say that they're frustrated by this recall petition. So there's a lot of support. Um, community events that I go to, people are overwhelmingly happy with what council has been doing. They are very interested in making sure that we are able to provide housing that allows people to live in dignity. They are very focused on ensuring that um, public safety is our priority, and they're very interested in transit. And those are the top three things that we invested in last budget. So we've done a really good job of creating strategies and then a budget that goes with it. Our job now for the next couple of years is to implement the things that will make life better for Calgarians. And if that's what I stay focused on, that's what I was elected to do. I was talking about this in an episode last week, just saying how, how kind of wild it is to me. I mean, people can do whatever they like. Uh, this petition is, is, you know, obviously legal. He's exercising his right as a citizen. Uh, I support people participating in democracy. Uh, but I just find it, to, to be quite honest, mind boggling that there's a recall petition aimed at you. Uh, and meantime, you've got a, a colleague on council who secured his seat under dubious circumstances with the public having minimal information. It wasn't until after the election 
election that Calgarians realized to the full degree, or at least the degree that they have now, uh, under which Sean Chu departed from the Calgary police under disgraceful conditions. Um, and there's been no recall initiative aimed at Councillor Chu. And I was musing about this last week, and, and somebody, I wish I could remember who it was, in our chat said, well, it's simple, Jespo, there's just, it all comes down to political will. There's just no political will to recall Sean Chu. Has that been a tough pill for you to swallow? You know, when you're working with a member of council that has this history, it's incredibly difficult every day. This is someone that serves on council with me. It's not up to me to initiate a recall petition. I can understand how time consuming this is and why people aren't able to follow through on it. Landon Johnson himself will tell you how much time is involved in a recall petition. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure why people aren't uh, launching one. I, I couldn't begin to tell you, but I can tell you this. It's not my job to be distracted by these things. And I can't sulk about why me and not somebody else. It's happening. It's in flight and it is something that is meant to be a distraction, but I won't let it be. And we will see what happens next election in terms of who comprises council. But right now is not the time to be thinking about that. For any members of council or members of the public that are trying to get us into an election cycle early, that's not our job. We need to be hyper-focused on attracting talent and capital to our city and making life better for Calgarians. Mayor, have you decided uh, whether or not you'll seek re-election next time around? Haven't decided that yet. It's too early. If we're focused on getting reelected, we are not making smart decisions. So, you know, you'll you'll know when I know. Don't All worry. right. I like it. Feel free to make the announcement here on this show. Uh, you know, the door is always open. I'll ask you this in closing. Uh, you're not the only mayor that's facing fire for increased property taxes. Uh, we did a great roundtable on Friday, as I mentioned, with uh, Mayors Gandam and Thorne from Wetaskiwin and Okotoks, uh, talking about the collective position of Alberta municipalities. I know here in Edmonton, I mean, don't quote me on the number, um, but they're looking right now at probably when it's all all said and done close to a nine, maybe a double digit percent increase in property taxes. It obviously has implications for the, the popularity or lack thereof of elected officials, etc. Can you tell us a little bit in closing about this? My understanding is Calgary secured its first municipal bond. There's like some sort of a new approach to finances or financing uh, as we wrap. Can you explain that to us and, and maybe why you think it might be the right move? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Mayors Gandam and Thorne are excellent representatives for all municipalities in Alberta. So, you know, whatever they had to say would have been very sound. Um, Calgary uh, just closed its first municipal bond, which means we didn't have to borrow money from the province for some projects that we have underway. We were able to borrow money from the markets and get a much better interest rate, which allows us to pay down the loan that we had from the provincial government and save Calgarians about $10 million uh, for a 10 year period annually, we're gonna be able to save about $10 million by implementing this good fiscal measure. So we are doing our best. And what I have to say is finding out that the provincial requisition for property tax ended up being higher than was anticipated actually impacted Calgarians in a negative manner. Your property taxes went up from what we proposed because the provincial requisition was higher. So I don't know that everyone understands that a good chunk of your taxes are flowing through to the province. And I think that becomes a big issue. When we don't know clearly where is the money going, people tend to focus on one order of government. There's actually two here. Yeah, there's, there's kind of a common theme here, maybe an underinformed public, which is not a slight to the public. It just means that people like you and me uh, can resolve to do better on that front. That starts with availability. We appreciate yours. Thanks for making time for us first thing Monday morning, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Have a great week. Yep, you as well. That's Calgary's Mayor, Dr. Jody Gondek, uh, joining us live on Real Talk, uh, recapping that meeting with Landon Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, we can take a look at her uh, uh, feedback here on the live chat. And uh, as we thank her for her time, her team, I know, is standing by. She's got meetings starting right away. But uh, mornings. Yeah. Kind of, uh, yeah. that's the one thing Especially about Monday this, mornings, this, right? This Landon guy, I see all these pictures of him out, and he's he's on foot, and he's in the snow, and he's collecting signatures, and it's not his recall that bothers me the most. You know what bothers me the most is I know this guy's one of those chipper morning people who's probably like, you know, when they walk down the street, they're like, that's right, they're they're swinging their arms. I saw one this morning, and I was like, oh, I hate you people. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate you know all the all the uh, the comments in the chat. I mean, some of the stuff here just has nothing to do with anything. It's a um, lot of footwork. You know, Kenzie this guy wants did. me to ask, you know, why does the mayor support drag show story time for little kids? Oh, like, gosh. what? Come on, you guys! Like, this is not like let's yeah. stay focused here. You know, and and I, I understand that maybe people have have sort of convinced you that these types of things are are, are the most important things for a mayor. I mean, some people said like you know like the mayor didn't support the premier's position on parents rights and yeah. so you're going to recall the mayor i mean like that's if, if you don't like the mayor number one <laughs> n number one did you vote in the last election a and if you didn't then do something about that next election and if you did then you know remind your friends remind those people around you why you think it's important to vote but ultimately you know someone in here says if you don't have recall it's not democratic or it's mm -hmm. not a democracy i mean that's that's ridiculous mm -hmm. uh, not every jurisdiction has recall uh, i don't mind having recall in place mm -hmm. i guess but but at the same same time I, I i just feel like number one it's distracting calgary's council from doing its job it's certainly distracting calgary's mayor and it just seems to be misfocused mm -hmm. i mean even even the things that you know landon wants this this organizer you know wants the mayor to put it to council should council vote on whether or not she should that's not even how it works yeah and it reminds <laughs> me of the coup d'etat do you remember the coup d'etat with george clark holding his this guy you know i hate to even say his name because now george is going to reach out on twitter and, and he's never even thanked me for making him famous but george, <laughs> but george would hold these news conferences and 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 here's the thing i want to tell you here's a little peek behind the scenes okay i don't I, I you know my own brain says to me as i'm about to go off on something like this says be careful because i don't want to sit you, the last thing i want to do is is mock and make fun of people for being involved in democracy for being engaged citizens okay which I, is what i did when it, we it, came out of the well, interview well no but, that, but I'm no, but johnny johnny people like you know what people like that you you just call it how it is he is you know, a hard and, and we want to call it how it is and so i don't want to make fun of just because somebody you know it's okay if you disagree with your mayor or counselors or trusting i disagree with my city council right now on almost every move that she makes if you want the honest truth um you know people it's okay it's good it's fine it's okay to disagree with your premier your government your prime minister it's okay to have strong feelings about that and to to, to educate yourself and understand what options there are but mm -hmm. you know george clark back in the day and he, he told these these news conferences he tried to get to rep reporters and he did one in a walmart parking lot which was just <laughs> obviously optic a tough look and a bit of a bad move <laughs> I guess it's where he could find enough room to congregate and get people to gather around but but he wanted to be he wanted to take petitions to the governor general to have the governor general force the prime minister to it's like this isn't how this yeah. works people don't even understand how it works now does that mean that we sit and like oh like we're so much smarter than everybody and make fun of them and laugh them off no because these are our fellow citizens and obviously there's a fire lit under them yeah so I I, I like the mayor's position here here on let's better that dialogue let's better the the communication i remember last time that mayor gondek was on some people wrote in and said you know you'd think for someone targeted with a recall petition you'd, you'd pick up on a little bit more humility yeah that was some of the feedback that we got and, and i guess i i pick up on that from her now in the sense you know people don't like the word humility aimed at them but if you look back at uh, her release her statement out on Friday this is the 22nd of March if you're looking for it on her Twitter account you know she says I understand that as a mayor the spotlight is on me to help Calgarians thrive and she says I'm going to make it my job to listen even more closely to Calgarians concerns to work even harder to address what I can she says equally as important I want to take the time to better explain the decisions council's making it's easy for me to get lost in the work and forge ahead without fully and plainly sharing the what and the why with those who elected me mm -hmm. i see a pro and a con there i see the pro as a mayor looking at a situation and saying you have spoken and i have listened and i have heard you mm -hmm. you feel ignored you feel denigrated you, you feel insulted you f whatever it is uh and so i'm going to do something i'm going to do as best i can uh something that indicates that I feel that and that I can respond to it. On the con side, on the flip side, this is the mayor essentially saying, uh, l l let me rephrase, it's easy for me to get lost in the work and forge ahead without fully sharing the what and why with those who elected me. It's like shareholders demanding that a CEO dumb down and explain to them in layperson's language every decision that a Fortune 500 company is making yeah. because I don't understand mm -hmm. what, uh, you know, what, what like some high profile CEO, like, so that to me is, 
in a way, not great. 100%. It's, it is the mayor's job to stay focused and to forge ahead and to keep moving and to keep driving the economy of one of the most important cities in the country, mm-hmm. one of the most important cities in North America. I mean, this, like, like the single-use plastic, like every big, every major city is doing this. It's not like Gondek is at the, the, the leading the charge for that. But you're right, though. She called his bluff. She sat down with him. I mean, they knew he wasn't going to get the signatures. She could have just... Ignored him. 100%. She gave him the time. She sat down with him. It seems like she cared, gave him respect. She didn't talk, you know, crappy about him coming on here with us. She did what she's supposed to do as an elected official when she could have just totally ignored him, knowing that he wouldn't get the signatures. So. I totally agree with yeah. you, Johnny. And, and and so I'll give her kudos for that. Uh, you can let us know what you think to talk at ryanjesperson.com. That's our uh, email inbox, obviously open 24 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, if you uh, if if you if you feel it, uh, you could send us a submission. I know it's a few days ahead, but for the flamethrower, every Friday uh, presented by our friends at the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, uh, your chance to blow off a little steam, get what you need off your chest. Uh, Charles Adler coming up in just a second, and we asked Chuck. Uh, yeah. I said he said, "Hey, make sure you watch this interview because I want to get your take on this." Mm-hmm. Uh, Charles doesn't live in Calgary, but obviously he's paid attention to political stories like this for a long time. This is somewhat of an unusual scenario maybe not right now in alberta because you got a few mayors with with recall initiatives aimed at them but but prior to this this was somewhat it somewhat unprecedented like it's starting to look like the norm in alberta right now but it has not been the norm we'll find out what chuck makes of that in just a quick second before we get there mayor gondek just talking about what they're expecting uh this season uh, drought we're expecting wildfires like we've maybe not seen for a while of course you know that just means an absolute mess the team at complete care restoration has been in the business for more than a quarter century of restoring properties and rebuilding peace of mind they do work across the province of alberta their teams are way up north right now still uh, putting communities back together after last year's wildfires the work never stops and you know hey i think it goes without saying If your home or business is affected by natural disaster, you want the right people looking after it. This team is trained, certified, and ready to respond 24-7. You can find them online at completecarerestoration.ca. If you're looking at leveling up your knowledge, better preparing yourself for a dynamic job market, maybe you just want to earn a little bit more, or maybe you just want to understand a little bit more about the world around you. (laughs) Good timing. Hey, Athabasca U does have poli-sci courses for anybody that's looking can understand the roles of three levels of government but i digress there's more advantages to athabasca university than you may even realize the world-class accredited online degrees and courses designed so you can complete your education whenever and wherever it works for you there's no commute your only commute is to your device and you work at your own schedule which means you're never falling behind and you can Zoom ahead if you're one of those keeners Johnny was talking about. Select your path today at AthabascaU.ca. Have you resolved to get organized, get decluttered this year? If so, there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't request a free consultation with the design team at California Closets today. Our family has done that exact thing. As a matter of fact, we're coming up on 10 years since we met with their design team and what they did for our personal space was transformative. We needed an entertainment center that could house puzzles and kids games and chargers and everything else without looking cluttered in our house's main room. We needed a walk-in closet in our primary bedroom that could reflect our needs and at the same time add value to the home and our experience living there. They delivered on both fronts. And we've been thrilled ever since. It's why I'm so excited when I talk about the possibilities of working with this team. Their installers are the most professional ones you'll find. The consultation is free and it starts with a visit to californiaclosets.ca. And a job announcement if you're a professional engineer working in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, or beyond, and you're looking to join a team that'll fully recognize your potential, help you reach new heights in your career, Apex Automation wants to hear from you right now. This is a team that's doing unbelievable work automating processes and controls. 
out in the ports in Vancouver, the potash mines in Saskatchewan, Alberta's dynamic oil and gas industry. Heck, they've even expanded to Texas and they're looking to grow from there. If this is lighting a fire under you, if you're feeling like this could be a fit, don't delay. Check out the careers link at apexautomation.ca. Just waiting for Charles to get in here. I'll just okay. give you a minute. No but, uh, yeah, good stuff. If you did see the Junos last night, I was going to say to you, uh, Tegan and Sarah giving it a humanitarian award and oh, really? gave a direct finger point to the UCP during their speech. Oh, wow. Actually, uh, I'll, I don't want to get this wrong, so I'll go right to it. So they were given, they came up on stage, they talked a bit about, you know, thanking people, and then they said they called out discrimination that threatens the well being of the 2S LGBTQ plus community, and they specifically took aim at uh, the Alberta government, said threats like the Alberta government's attempts to prevent trans youth from accessing vital care are part of this. So, wow. That was pretty big to hear on a big stage last night. Uh, sitting there, you know, after an Oilers loss, you know, you know, relatively like you tune into the Junos, you think, you know, but it's, it's going to be great. And, uh, you know, I thought it'd be kind of low key. Oh, Maestro Fresh West, Nelly Furtado, same deal every year. And then I heard that. I was like, wow, that's pretty significant. So yeah. we'll see. Here's Charles. I'll just get him in. But huh. We'll see what he has to say about that. Yeah, Johnny. Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. hundred percent. Didn't watch the Junos. I know you didn't. That's why I threw it in. No offense to the Junos. Uh, support Canadian music. Uh, you know, didn't uh, I kind of sort of realize the Junos were on, but uh, that's OK. appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Charles Adler, uh, Emmy Award winning talk radio legend, joining us the first episode of every week. And that includes today. Chuck, you were tuned in Amazing. for our conversation with uh, is he still still chiming in? We're having some technical difficulties here. OK, no worries. Uh, welcome to Monday, everybody. I'm going to jump in the live chat. Uh, James says way to go. Tegan and Sarah. Uh, Tegan and Sarah, I feel like I kind of came up with them. They attended uh, Ish Western Canada High School in Calgary, but of course they were uh, always they were already touring at that point in our in our upbringing. But yeah, it's kind of neat when when uh, like you're a teen and they're a teen, and then you come up and here we are in our forties, and then they're still just killing it. Uh, good for them. Good to see. Um, James says uh, we need to start a movement to white hat Charles Adler. Uh, the Calgarians will know that reference. I think probably everybody in Canada knows the Calgary white hat reference, don't you? Which is like an official. It's like kind of giving, not exactly, but it's kind of like giving the key to the city uh, when the mayor of Calgary bestows somebody the white cowboy hat. However, there was much controversy last year where a third party group bestowed its own white hat. Do you remember that, Charles, on a controversy? Controversial visitor, that uh, yeah. German politician, and and, and then yeah. the mayor had to speak out and say the city, this is not an official white hatting. Well, it kind of gave me an idea. Maybe we should start handing out our own keys to the city. We don't need to wait for mayor's offices to do these sorts of things. I was uh, given the I was the only uh, talk show host ever in uh, Toronto history to get a key uh, to the city, and uh, Mayor Lastman was the mayor of Toronto at the time, and so he was asked, of course, by reporters, uh, why is Adler getting a key? And Mayor Lastman said, because if it wasn't for Adler, I wouldn't be the mayor. So. <laughs> Is that for real? So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, and it was an I actual helped, uh, physical key to the city? Like, did, how, how, what was it? A yeah. couple couple of feet across? Yeah. And, <laughs> and what did it weigh? It about, What's it made out of? <laughs> chocolate? No, no, it was made, made out of, I, I guess, it was made out of fool's gold. I mean, it wasn't really gold, but it was golden. And uh, it was uh, in a really nice uh, box, like a like a we used to call them the, the Great Burke's Blue Boxes. It was always a big deal when you gave someone a ring in a Burke's Blue Box. Yeah, anyway, uh, big deal. It was it, it was rather nice, and the reporters got very very haughty about that. They they uh, they they thought that uh, Lastman was just uh, kidding, and uh, Lastman said, "No, you know, uh, I, I I ran uh, I ran a uh, I ran defense for him. I mean, he was being attacked by." All kinds of people for all the wrong reasons. They didn't like his, didn't like his clothes. They didn't like his height. Uh, they didn't like the way he talked. They didn't like the way the, the fact that he was a, um, a a person who sold uh, furniture and appliances. I really related to him. I th thought he was a small business guy who had really built up uh, North York, uh, made it um, an enormous center of of opportunity. Uh, did a lot for education. Did a lot for charities. I was very a uh, pro uh, Mel Lastman and um, and most reporters and. In downtown Toronto, we're not. Wow. That's pretty amazing that typically when you look at somebody that's awarded the key to the city, it's like, 
you know, they introduced the school lunch program or yeah. they, they turned around the, you know, the, the destitute East End. Uh, no, yours was just that you ensured the mayor's political survival. And I hope I helped. Makes no helped bones elect, about it. I helped elect a uh, pro-business mayor. That's why, you know, one of the things I always laugh about uh, during appearances like this and uh, some of the things have gone on for the last couple of years, my 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 shootout with uh, with, with Jason Kenny and all that. I get tagged by all these UCP types as this this flaming socialist. Now, it always makes me giggle because they have they have no idea what they're talking about. They have no idea who I am. They, they as as it would, you know some, just to borrow from scripture, they know not what they do. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Did you ever try to use your key to the city on anything? Did, did you ever no. like show up at a Maple Leafs game without a ticket <laughs> or try to get into the hottest <laughs> restaurant on a Saturday night with a reservation? No, I just I just thought it was I just thought it was funny, funny one of the funniest things that's ever happened to me and I just couldn't believe how candid uh, the mayor was cuz he could he could have he could have said that, you know, Charles Adler inspires a lot of people to do great works and he'd been great for the city. No, he just was very direct about it. I I wouldn't be mayor without him. <laughs> wow. I love it. Hey, you were tuned in for our uh, chat with uh, Jody Kondek, mayor of Calgary. Yeah. Kind, of, kind of an interesting behind-the-scenes perspective. You hear how she, she crosses paths with the organizer of this petition, essentially calling for her head. And uh, grants him, Landon Johnson, a, a meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, very few people yeah. will get that, especially with the politician they're trying to take down. What do you make of the whole story? Well, I, I just think she's, she's, she's very classy, and she's a lot classier than those people who are I trying to take him down. I'm not going to talk about specifically the, the that particular, you know, the, the central dude in the petition thing. But I'm just talking about the the general movement, which is a, a technically grassroots, uh, social conservative, David Parkery, a kind of thing to, uh, you know, change municipal politics to make it a party system so that some party warlord uh, can warlord over uh, municipalities the way they they do provincial political parties. I think that would be just absolutely horrible. I think uh, that, uh, you know, they, they talk about democracy and that we need the recall for democracy. There is more democracy, much more democracy in municipal politics than there is in provincial politics. I mean, municipal politics, you, you don't have a bunch of, you know, lapdogs for, for the party warlord, just, you know, saluting and, and nodding and affirming and, and doing what lapdogs do. I mean, no, no, just not disparaging lapdogs. I've had a number of lap dogs that have enhanced my life. Yeah, you live with a couple of them, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Easy. I hope they don't get it. Hope, I, don't, I don't want to offend you. Hope they don't uh, speak but, English, pal. Yeah, but, 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 but seriously, you know, I could have said trained SEALs and, and offended some SEALs. But the thing is that provincial politics and federal politics is so filled with things that don't even resemble democracy. Because really, you know, you've got situations provincially and, and, and federally where supposedly the person that you're electing is there to represent you the people but really for the most part they're they're salespeople not because i want to offend salespeople i've been a salesperson they're very important but once again generally the way democracy works at the provincial and federal level is the person who you're electing becomes an agent for the party warlord for the leader for the premier for the prime minister and that doesn't resemble democracy as people see it. People want the people that they're electing to represent them to the power. They want th those representatives to speak truth to power. That's not the way it happens in party politics, but it does happen that way in municipal politics. So for the phony baloney SOCONs out there who keep talking about democracy and freedom and whatever, there is far more freedom and far more democracy involved in the infrastructure of municipal politics than there ever will be in provincial and federal. And so I salute uh, Mayor Gondek and I salute the various mayors that you had on uh, last week and the association representing the mayors. They are champions for democracy and I don't want to see them being skewered because they don't happen to go along with some of the SOCON stuff. Like uh, you got the p person commenting uh, today, uh, one of your followers uh, saying, well, what about, uh, what is it? Uh, drag queen drag story queens, time. Drag yeah. queens. T talking about you know the reading nursery rhymes or story. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean that, that's I, it, and, and not to try to disparage organized religion, but you know if some churches want to get into that stuff on a Sunday, and get their people torqued up about that. That's fine. That's church. That that is that is not city council. That is not city politics. I don't want I don't want the city mayors and the councilors wasting five minutes 
on whether drag queens are reading stories to children. Yeah, and then, well, and this is kind of what uh, I mean. Yeah, number one, the, the drag queen story time, and you know, the mayor pushing back on you know uh, her you know li- lack of support. Obviously, she had a real problem with uh, Daniel Smith's policies on uh, you know so called parental rights. I don't like how that's being framed. By the way, I don't like that this is being called the parental rights movement. Parents still have rights. Parents always have rights. Uh, and I just I don't like how that's being framed uh, because you know you get to a point where all of a sudden it's like you know if you if you if you don't support uh, this full disclosure, then you don't support or you're anti parents' rights. Here, here. Which you know, I just I think that the, the language on that, the phrasing on that, is flawed. So I don't love it. But this is all like a lot of this stuff is is tiny little stuff. Like so, the mayor pushes back on the province for something big. Like number one. So you what are you, what are you saying? Like you 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 want a mayor? All these people that are signing the petition because of that. You want a mayor that just sort of like. <laughs> And like just waits for the waits. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Madam Premier. Yes. What, like, what, oh, what thank, is, what is thank this, you, what, Madam what is, Premier. Like, what is, what is saluting uh, Danielle Smith have to do with democracy? Nothing, you know, you know and like a uh, news flash, like not every politician is going to going to understand, you know, those things through the same lens or agree on the same sort of approach to, to issues or problems or challenges. You know, all of a sudden, if this is going to trigger recalls every single time, I just think we've lost our minds. But it, but it does bring come down to a question that, you know, right before we chatted with you, Johnny and I were kind of getting into it. And that is, you know, I, I, I find myself. You know, to be honest with you, I could argue either side of this. I find myself impressed that that the mayor says I under I recognize that maybe there's not, and she's trying not to insult anybody in how she words yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, she didn't say some, you know, some of you dummies just sort of don't understand the first thing about how this, <laughs> all this shit works. <laughs> she can't put it like that, so she says I recognize there's a breakdown. You know, let, you know, maybe I should read her actual words. So I'm not putting words in her mouth, but she, you know, <laughs> she basically says I you know I recognize I was elected to be leader, and I'm going to make it my job to listen even more, address what I can you know i want to take the time to better explain the decisions council's making you know i've taken some time to reflect on what i said i made a commitment to do my best to stop the polarization i'm committed to doing my part and so she's she's coming at this from from a position i think of of saying i'm gonna do my best i'm gonna do my part uh, to be better moving forward. Now, the flip side of this, of course, is that now you've got a mayor that's probably going to be less focused on her job, uh, ultimately like running the city and and building consensus on council and reflecting the you know and 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 uh, adjusting to the concerns that Calgary Calgarians have, and instead spending more time kind of dumbing things down and explaining it to the kids in the back that didn't go to right. social studies thirteen. You know, they were out in the back in the smoke pit. You know who you are and so I, I you know I'm kind of torn on that one to be honest with you well you know the thing is that we're living in a society where everybody wants to polarize everybody else both the left and the right uh, play that game and unfortunately both play it uh, with, with sending out a lot of disinformation and disinformation gets in the way of democracy and disinformation helps liars and sometimes the people who tell the boldest lies the most frequently, the ones who are most comfortable with lying because they believe that it's in the interest of some other, you know, larger cause, they end up winning. Uh, you know, they, they do this in provincial politics, they do that in federal, but God help us if they also do it in municipal because it's the last stand for real democracy. It's the last stand for real grassroots democracy in Alberta and the rest of the country. So I just would ask people who who see these um, these movements, these petitions, these so-called efforts to uh, do grassroots democracy. I just want people to to check out what they're really saying, what they're about. Where is their heart? Where is their passion? And if their passion is around the same tedious two or three social conservative hot button issues, then you know it's a fraud. Chuck, I, I want to ask you about this uh, this Trump story that's uh, obviously a huge focus down in the U.S., but it'll have implications around the world. And, and I think, number one, not just uh, because it could have legal implications for the man who wants to be president again, but also because it calls into question his whole presentation. Is Trump who he says he is? Is he worth as much as he says he is? So here's the deal. Uh, The day that we're talking about this uh, is the deadline for the former president to post a $464 million bond in a fraud case. Uh, He's not done it, uh, at least not 
at this point while we're talking, uh, that, and it's needed to pause enforcement of a judge's February ruling in a civil fraud case filed in New York. It could leave some of his prized real estate and other assets vulnerable to seizure by the state. Uh, the time ticked out when the clock hit midnight on this Monday morning. Where do you see this going? Well, here, here's where I, I see it going for a lot of people. Without getting into the weeds of uh, politics and, and and the law and New York and uh, the Attorney General, uh, you know, raising money for her campaign by saying she's going to attack Trump and all of that, um, I just want to put all of that aside. What has been devastating for Trump and devastating to the Trump brand, it is now clear that the emperor has no clothes. The most important thing to the Trump brand was the idea that Trump was not just a billionaire, a multi-billionaire, very rich. Why was that important? Not because some people envy the rich, not because some people believe that, you know, plutocrats and incredibly wealthy people should be the president of the United States and the president of everything else. That's got nothing to do with it. The idea was that in a corrupt country, and, every, every, you know, the, that, that's populism's favorite term, you know, there's, there's, there's freedom, uh, there's uh, accountability, and there's corruption. You're always fighting the corrupt, okay? So Trump, being as wealthy as he supposedly was, told the people who are fighting corruption and fighting for accountability, and they want to, you know, burn down the swamp and all that kind of crap, uh, they wanted to believe that Trump could not be influenced by money, couldn't be influenced by foreign money, couldn't be influenced by domestic money, couldn't be influenced by politics, by, by the politics of the lobbyists, because he had so much freaking money. And of course, he doesn't. He just doesn't. Uh, he has a lot of properties. Uh, the properties are encumbered. They're, they're levered. Without getting into the weeds of finance, it means that there's very little cash. There's very little equity in those properties. Trump has been running a great con job for many years, and the number one con was that he was a multi-billionaire. Years ago, a serious journalist wrote a serious book making the case against this fantasy that Trump is a multi-billionaire, and Trump sued him because it was so important for Trump to have people believe that he was one of the richest people in the world. And guess what, Ryan? That lawsuit was lost. Donald Trump lost. That lawsuit told people who were paying attention that Donald Trump is not nearly as rich as he says he is. And after all is said and done in all of these cases revolving around money, it'll be clear to every American that, yes, Trump can be influenced by money because he doesn't have as much as you thought he did. I'm referencing a report from uh, CBS News, which is pretty wild. Uh, they, they're talking about, uh, you know, they're talking to experts here in this field. Uh, and they say that the judge in this case uh, could sign an execution forcing Trump to turn over his political property. They say that it could be Rembrandts, Rolls Royces, iPads, whatever the case. But get this, uh, Trump, uh, the presumptive Republican nominee for president could ultimately end up among the one in a hundred Americans. So one out of a hundred Americans on average has their pay withheld for creditors. Uh, so creditors can collect uh, citing Adam Kaufman, an attorney at Lewis Bach Kaufman Middlemiss says you could have a president of the United States having his wages garnished by a creditor. How wild is that? They, they, they could, uh, here, here's something for the convoy crowd. They're going to love this. This attorney general, if she wants to, can freeze Donald Trump's personal and corporate bank accounts if she chooses to. Wild. Yeah, uh, so, oh. you know, the, 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 the bottom line is, if you want to elect a president who is desperate for money 24-7, if that's his number one preoccupation, he can easily be influenced by foreign despots who will send him some money. The accusation has been made that foreign despots have sent the Trumps money. Those are accusations. But what would feed the accusations, what would feed all of the apprehension and the speculation, the negative speculation about Donald Trump is the idea that Donald Trump doesn't have a pot to piss in, doesn't have a golden pot to piss in anymore. And if the Saudis or the Russians or the Chinese or somebody wants to send him some, some money, uh, he'll be happy to take it. And if the Russians or the Chinese or others 
wanted to change foreign policy, domestic policy, internet policy, TikTok policy, he'll do it. He'll do whatever it takes for the money. So for those people who feel that Donald Trump is basically the top whore in North America, which is how many rich people do speak to him, speak about him behind the scenes and why many rich people don't want to donate to Donald Trump, don't want to loan him money. I always laugh when people uh, ask the question, why don't rich Republicans want to loan money to Donald Trump? Because he, because he did beat. Rich people didn't become rich. Billionaires didn't become billionaires because they were loaning money to people who wouldn't pay the money back. Huh. But the, the more this stuff goes on, the more it affects Trump. And I can just tell you without once again getting into the weeds, the Democrats are outraising Republicans by three to one right now. And that's because a lot of rich people and a lot of middle class people simply do not trust that Donald Trump will be caring about anything but himself and his money problems. And if there's any country in the world, I mean, you know, the United States of America is the capital of capitalism. If there's any country in the world where it's not really good to look like a deadbeat, especially if you're a Republican, it's the United States of America. Hmm. Uh, Bunny Slippers says if Trump gets money from foreign governments, uh, boy, is that ever a conflict of interest if he gets in again? Uh, Saucy Seawitch says maybe Elon will pay Trump's bill. He's helping out that doctor. Uh, if I understand what Saucy's getting at, uh, I don't know if you saw this, Chuck. I don't have it handy. Uh, it just popped up here in our chat. But but X, like Twitter, basically announced that they're supporting this Canadian doctor uh, in, in, in her fight for free speech. Uh, this was a doctor that was critical of COVID crackdowns and the like. And, and so X, like Twitter, a, a, a publicly traded corporation well, has no, taken just, a position just to, just to correct you it's not it's not publicly traded anymore oh yeah fair enough that's right yeah they bought yeah, it you're right you're yeah. right you're right you're right you're yeah. right multi-billion dollar massive corporation with yeah what yeah. how many hundreds of millions of users around the world uh has it's taken big. has taken a position uh in a free speech fight saying that they're going to back this canadian physician which i just thought uh seems like a strange one for me because i can guarantee uh, I mean, you know, I hope I may, maybe they'll surprise me. Maybe they'll prove me wrong. But I suspect that that commitment to help controversial voices fight for free speech does not extend across the political spectrum, across the ideological spectrum. So now Twitter's going to pick and choose winners and losers in the fight for free speech. It just I don't know. I saw that when I was walking the dog yesterday. It raised a huge red flag for me. I don't know about you. Well, freedom is freedom is used very promiscuously uh, these days. Uh, freedom has become kind of a. Uh, a brand uh, for the right uh, freedom freedom has come to mean we get to lie about you anytime we want to and if you want to come after us we'll really come after you we'll come after you with our algorithms we'll come after you with our our followers we'll come after you with elon musk i mean elon musk is uh, you know is, is is now i guess joining uh joining the convoy it's a it's a it's a good day to be a convoy by the way there's one other thing i wanted to throw in about the money and why the money uh, issue is uh is so important to, when it comes to Republicans versus Democrats. Many Republicans won't say this out loud, but many of them want Joe Biden to be reelected. And one reason for that is nothing with liberalism, wokeism, um, you know, the, the Democratic Party, its traditions, none of that. It's because rich people do tend to look at their balance sheets, not always every hour, but, you know, every few weeks, they take a look at what their net worth is. And when they see their net worth is double what it was four years ago, the, the Trump message of, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Rich people are saying, yes, you idiot. Where have you been? And so if, if rich people in America are relatively satisfied with their lot right now, they may not like Joe Biden. They may not like the Democrats. They may not even vote for the Democrats necessarily, but they're not going to vote for change because the status quo is really good to them. Here's the post, uh, which uh, went up, and I see it was just edited, which is interesting. Uh, last edited, March 24th. But here's the post from Twitter, uh, the post X News. Uh, X is proud to help defend Dr. Colvinder Cower gill against the government-supported efforts to cancel her speech. Uh, talks about the doctor, a practicing physician in Canada, spoke publicly on Twitter in opposition to federal and provincial COVID lockdown efforts, vaccine mandates, uh, says she was harassed by the legacy media. Like this is a position that this corporate entity, arguably the, the most, 
well, what, among the most powerful. Is it? It's not the most powerful social. Well, it's most, platform it's the most in the world. influential. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. I think TikTok might actually be now, and then Instagram. I, mean, I don't know. I'm just. I mean, that's a matter of opinion. That's a matter of opinion. But Twitter is obviously has some heft. X carries some heft. Well, fa- fa- Facebook, Instagram, tw- uh, TikTok, and sure. Twitter. They're the, all those, yeah. The big four. Okay. okay, so so to see like like can you imagine Facebook taking a corporate position that some that an individual was harassed by legacy media censored by prior Twitter management they say so and then they start getting into disciplinary proceedings by the colleges of uh, physicians and surgeons in Ontario like what the hell does Elon Musk know about the college of physicians and surgeons in Ontario anyway they say the legal battles uh, cost Dr. Gill her life savings. She owes 300 grand in a court judgment due Monday. When Elon Musk heard about this, he pledged to help. Twitter X is now funding the rest of her campaign so she can pay her $300,000 judgment and her legal bills. They say free speech, the bedrock of democracy and critical defense against totalitarianism in all forms. We must do whatever we can to protect it. And at X, at Twitter, we will always fight to protect your right to speak freely. I mean, some people might call this a precedent. And when you set a precedent, people might look and say, well, listen, I mean, I fought free speech for issue x fill in the blanks no pun intended fill in the blanks and uh where's my support from elon musk because i lost my a lot of people have lost their life savings fighting moronic fights and uh if this is the precedent i don't know where this is going well a lot of a lot of grifters are going to be you know belling up to the trough and hoping that elon musk uh elon musk helps them obviously elon musk is looking for examples of uh, people who have uh Try to kick the living crap out of the establishment. I don't. I don't think he uh, cares particularly about how many uh, you know facts they have in their favor. You know, some people they, you know, pound on the facts. Those are the people you and I tend to respect. Others just kind of keep pounding on the table and repeating things ad nauseum. Uh, Elon Musk is Elon Musk. He loves attention. I mean, that's one of the things that Elon Musk has in common with Donald Trump. Elon Musk is a hell of a lot smarter. Than Donald Trump, and yes, Elon Musk is a lot richer than, than than Donald Trump. But Elon Musk does love the attention, doesn't he? He's a lot richer than everybody. Sorry, I didn't answer that question right away because I didn't know what you were asking. Like, is Twitter the biggest social well, media platform in terms of branding, in terms yeah, of money? Just, in terms They've of gone influence. way down. If you're talking about most so, like active users monthly, yeah, they're like thirteenth now. It's crazy. You've what, got, dude? Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, Telegram, Snapchat, then X, Twitter now. Wow. So only 619 million or something like that active monthly users like okay. the, the, every day that log in. So so they've gone way down. But in terms of money, they're probably like in the top four or five huh. as well. But I, 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 it used to be the exact opposite. It oh, used yeah. to be Twitter was like top two all the well, time. Well, Twitter but- still shines when there's like, you know, like a, a tsunami or something. Sure. There, there's something like an al- a live event. And we're going to talk about October 7th. We're going to talk about Israel's uh, war with Hamas in just a second. But like in those instances where something is happening live, uh, nothing operates like Twitter can. Um, I, I don't know if Twitter, you know, I mean, obviously Elon's putting his own stamp on it. I saw I saw someone here and I wanted to read the comment. They said Elon is doing great things for this world. And like, I agree. Elon is doing a lot of he great. He, well, he is, though. What's I mean, he I, done for you lately? Well, I mean, <laughs> Elon Musk is. I, I, listen, I think that that Elon Musk is is uh, eccentric and what billionaire isn't. Um, I think that he's obviously got some issues, but also I kind of respect that he is who he is and he does what he does. I think that his vision on with things like Tesla, and I understand that he didn't invent all the technology and there's other people driving Tesla as well. Um, but but like that's remarkable. I think his SpaceX work is amazing. Like Elon, people that say he's an idiot. He's not an idiot. No, no, no. Uh, no. He's, not, he's not even close yeah. to an idiot, but he's an egomaniac. Uh, yeah, he, he is, but he is... is- his ego sometimes is sometimes his heart's in the right place. His ego is yeah. in the right place. Take a look at Neuralink. You know, uh, I don't want to get into I don't want to get into doing an infomercial here for Neuralink, but just Google Neuralink. Uh, do some homework on what Neuralink is about, and if Neuralink is developed in the way that Elon Musk wants to see it developed, you're going to see a lot of people who are currently disabled able. He will he will at some point try to make blind people see. He is doing incredible things, attaching mind, the person, the human mind 
to technology, and he's got some of the smartest minds in uh, the world uh, accessing some of his capital and the capital of uh, some of his friends to do some uh, great things for the human condition. So I don't want to sit here and throw rocks at uh, at Elon Musk because he's got a he's got a his version of freedom. He's got a he's got a freedom fetish. There are things he does that are far more important than uh, some of the political things that we've been talking about that have to do with improving uh, the the human condition. And Elon Musk is very much for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I he's mean, not the only one doing that though. And the the other thing with the EVs, like there's a lot of EVs, especially nowadays. The company's is way ahead of Tesla now, right? Sure. So, so I'm not saying like you know. I agree the guy's smart. He's not a rocket scientist, and a lot of the stuff no, he's No, he literally is now, a rocket scientist. I mean, but, like, he is, but you know what I mean? He literally is. He just ran into a wall there, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. I do know what you're saying, but so anyway, but I, 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 Elon Musk is but complicated. he's a leader. I mean, you can, you can he's talk a leader. about the other EVs. I'm not here to pump uh, uh, Elon Musk's tires, but, you know, yes, there are a lot of people out there uh, manufacturing EVs. Obviously, the, the big three are now manufacturing EVs. But Elon Musk was the leader. Sure. And he's the leader in battery technology, and then that matters. Yeah, like sure, Trav- Travis okay. here says, you know, Elon's never accomplished a freaking thing except figuring out how to get government money. I mean, that's just not true. That's just that's just no, not true no. at all. Let me let me I, circle back on this, Charles. We have our super chat. You know, this is a great way to get our attention. Sure. We don't we don't guarantee your comments get read when you when you th- you know throw a few bucks our way, but but you certainly increase and improve your chances. <laughs> and uh, I want to know that is uh, it time uh, for me to get the chocolate milk out? No, 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 no. We're no, we're not showing chocolate milk anymore until we sell that sponsorship but I'll, <laughs> but I'll let you know that that ken has ken has tossed five bucks into the super chat he says that's for a beer for adler so we'll keep it cold in the fridge for you bud but this one from garth who's who's topped up garth throws 10 bucks into the super chat Whoa. uh we're going to circle back to trump and then we'll move on because i want to talk to you about uh about the column that you wrote chuck uh two wrongs no rights uh but garth says uh, circling back to donald trump uh, says these events make it hard to ignore when they say that trump is politically targeted uh when issues from the 80s are just coming up now why are you and adler ignoring that uh that from garth Uh, i i don't know exactly what he's talking about but i would say this i don't think we're talking exclusively about issues from the 80s but if you are but but just because something i mean if garth's maybe referencing some of the the sexual assault allegations from the 80s or i don't know what he's referencing specifically oh, I see. Okay. but yeah. i i don't yeah, know probably. i don't know but that doesn't mean yeah. like just because they happened in the 80s doesn't mean they didn't happen i'm not sure exactly what garth's getting at here but listen garth i mean i will say this uh every politician is politically targeted we literally just did a half hour interview with a mayor down in calgary who is being politically targeted um this show applies uh, political pressure this show responds to political pressure um and it's fair to say that when you're seeking uh, the highest office in the land again after completely disgracing the highest office in the land you're going to face a little fire from talk shows uh, garth i hope i'm understanding your point correctly did you want to add anything chuck well he's in he's in criminal court today uh, donald trump but this has nothing to do with the uh uh, the civil piece where they're going to take a half billion dollars of property off him or freeze his bank accounts or whatever. But um, aside from that, he's in a criminal court today in New York. Uh, this is a, another case, and this involves hush money, and it's the Stormy Daniels thing. And I, I don't think he attacked Stormy Daniels in a dressing room in the 80s. I think it was much more recent than that, and it was in a hotel. And he wasn't attacking her. Uh, he was just uh, doing what Donald Trump wants to do with uh, with, with women uh, his wife happened to be pregnant at the time when he was with uh, stormy daniels the porn star uh, stormy daniels uh, got uh, a hush money payment it all became very public and, and very nasty and uh, i guess paying hush money when you're running for uh, high office is uh, potentially a criminal piece and that's what they're doing today to donald trump and he's showing up in court for the simple reason that he believes that every time he's in court, he's got a good chance, a good shot at getting mega publicity and raising more money to uh, to help himself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Garth follows up and says, he says, no, I'm talking about the loans and the business stuff. I mean, I don't know. I mean, he was he was convicted in court around fraud. That's what this is. It's a court judgment. Uh, why is Kyle says there's a difference between being targeted while in politics uh, as opposed to being targeted by the political machine? Guys, I'm not going to, I'm sorry, I don't buy into the whole like Trump's being politically targeted. I mean, Trump... 
targets people for political reasons probably more than anybody else on planet Earth. Is this a serious just, conversation? Just, just, just so everyone knows, because I think most people in Alberta, yeah, I don't want to get into the whole oil and gas thing about the, the big guys. Uh, the, the piece of oil and gas that I support most is the little guys who are the contractors who do all of the work that's outsourced to them by, by the big guys. So I think everyone should be able to relate to the idea that there's no way that Donald Trump was able to do anything with the hotels, the casinos, without a lot of contractors and subcontractors. He screwed many of them, okay? And his attitude was, I don't like what you did. If you don't like me, take me to court. He had good lawyers back then, much better lawyers than the small guys could have afforded. And so small guys got screwed, some of them for millions of dollars. Some of them went right into the poorhouse because they couldn't afford to try to collect from Donald Trump. So for all the contractors and subcontractors, small business people, family business people who relate to Donald Trump, just remember, Donald Trump has screwed many people, honest, hardworking people just like you. And think about this. Donald Trump has been around doing business since the 80s, 70s and 80s and 60s, actually 60s, 70s, 80s up till now. And how often have you seen a character reference on video anywhere where someone says, I was poor, but Donald Trump made me a millionaire or Donald Trump made me a multimillionaire. You don't see any of those because Donald Trump has screwed people out of their money and Donald Trump cares about no one outside himself. And for those people who think that Donald Trump is a pro small business guy, a pro family business guy, I'm sorry, that's about as untrue as the idea that Donald Trump is a multi-billionaire. The emperor has no close. Johnny, I've just got a text, a personal text from my friend Elise, who is a professional engineer, and she has... Oh, I knew she, it. I was just thinking about no, it. No, she's on your team. She, he is not a rocket she, scientist. She says, Elon Musk. A, she says he's he, an engineer. She says he has a degree in physics yes. and a degree in economics. And he's a bachelor degree in she, economics. She says, so he's not, she says he's a rocket entrepreneur. He is. He said himself he, he's, he's an engineer with a bachelor's degree in economics <laughs> who taught himself rocket science which lots of people i mean you can go on youtube there's a rabbit hole of people who try to say he's not a rocket scientist but anyone who gets a team together and develops rocketry i mean Amazing. it's hard to hard to disagree that they're not a rocket scientist but technically he's not but but i don't know if you guys heard but through the, the uh, ever since the pandemic now we've we've changed uh, how we approach <laughs> all this stuff so now as a matter of fact you can educate yourself yeah. and, and become a, a physicist or an i'm, I'm going to sure do you, it today i'm, I'm going to go sure on you do youtube that. yes I'm make a small rocket in the studio yeah, today yeah and then I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry did i see you just open a <laughs> surgical clinic yeah don't worry don't worry i've just been uh i read a few facebook posts and watched a few youtube videos and i'm gonna be doing, <laughs> i'm gonna be doing yeah i'm doing hip replacements now i'm in no way disregarding that the guy isn't smart and and has developed some incredible technology i'm not doing that at all i'm He's, just saying that today i feel like there's not a lot what have you done for me lately elon I other like than it. hey i like throw it. bombs into let's just the public discourse. You know? We'll let that marinate. What has he done don't, for don't us you, lately? Don't you miss the days, Ryan, when uh, people would call you up, you're doing the talk show, and you're just doing your best to bring out the best information possible, and someone calls up and says, I don't care about your freaking scientist at the University of Alberta. Yeah. What about my Facebook page? Yes. What about the 20 people in my Facebook group? What about the 20 people in my church group? Why, why, why would I care about Harvard and, and the University of Alberta and the University of British Columbia and Nobel Prize winners? I've got my Facebook. I've got my research. And, and then and then to, to superimpose the conspiracy theory onto it, which is that uh, I don't care about what your pediatric oncologist had to say about early onset, you know, uh, you know, someone that's, oh, why don't you ask him? I noticed, I noticed you didn't ask him where their funding came from. I noticed you didn't ask him who's paying them. Uh, well, at the same time, uh, you know, at the same time, they look at this and they say, but I did read that one report. I did read that 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 one thing on my Facebook. And I noticed that conveniently you haven't mentioned it all week. Yeah, dude, I think we have different Facebook friends. I think we're reading different sources for information. I remember one one uh, one caller a couple of years ago happened to be from Alberta and uh, was into the whole conspiracy schlamazel was into the whole deal and uh, was telling me that I was uh, pumping the tires of a big pharma, specifically Moderna and Pfizer. So I said, so, so you're not, you're not for pro big pharma. Uh, I said, do you have any members of the family with uh, cancer? 
And the person says, I've got cancer. In fact, I just had chemotherapy. And I said, I said, I said, A, F cancer, and B, F anyone who thinks that big pharma isn't helping you. Yeah. Although we can talk about prescription prices. Maybe we'll save that for another episode. Uh, obviously, Big Pharma leaves a bit to be desired, but I do back science, and so does this show. We've taken I'm, that position. I'm not doing infomercial with Big yeah. Pharma, but the idea that Big Pharma isn't helping us oh. to deal with the most serious diseases in the world, I mean, anyone who, anyone who doesn't believe that is not living on this planet. I remember doing an interview uh, on a terrestrial radio station where I used to work, and there were two oncologists in the studio with me right two cancer experts in the studio yeah. with me yeah. and we open up the phone lines probably against my better judgment although our ratings were always sky high so maybe there was something to it but to see the faces on those two when a caller dialed in and suggested that cancer had been cured and mm -hmm. that the cure to cancer was being suppressed because of the money involved in yeah. fundraising around cancer i saw the one guy looked like he was about to blow a gasket uh uh, and, and I, I just, I don't know. I knew that that was a moment I'd never forget. I've been, I've been around that one um, a time or two. The first time was, oh my God, it was, wasn't doing talk radio. It was just doing regular middle of the road radio, doing interviews with people. And, and uh, one of the people uh, who was an oncologist, uh, this is in uh, Montreal. And I said uh, to them, I said, what's the greatest, uh, uh, you know, piece of offensive stuff that's, uh, that's come at you because, Obviously, cancer is controversial. It'll always be controversial. And uh, the oncologist, she told me that the most difficult thing for her was members of her own family uh, asking her whether whether uh, anyone has ever offered her money uh, to not uh, do research properly. Because, of course, if the research isn't done properly and there is no cure for cancer, uh, there's much more money. Uh, for uh, for the establishment that is involved in helping people with cancer and she was she had tears in her eyes it was the most difficult thing for her that even members of her own family thought uh, that she might be looking after her money more than her patients chuck before we run out of time i want to make sure that we get a chance uh to touch on your winnipeg free press column uh, this week uh, it's a column you said you never wanted to write but, but let me just put some numbers out there oxfam international uh, a few days ago uh responding to the integrated food security phase classification report um, on Gaza, uh, stating that famine is imminent in northern Gaza. More than one million people are experiencing food insecurity in the approximate five and a half months uh, since this war started. Uh, 31,000 Palestinians have been killed, including thousands of children. 14, more than 1,400 uh, Israelis have been killed. 94 uh, confirmed uh, deaths of journalists, uh, nearly 140 aid workers have been killed. The headline of your column, which you say you never wanted to write, two wrongs, no rights. Where's your head at today? Well, my, my head is in a place where I recall uh, Johnny. Uh, it was uh, just after you and I wrapped up a, a conversation about uh, Gaza, and I told you how uh, difficult it was uh, for me to watch uh, the, the carpet bombing of, of Gaza. Uh, I'm not one of these people who believes that uh, you follow up on something as uh, egregious and difficult as o October 7th uh, by uh, by killing 10 times more, 100 times more, 200 times more. Uh, it's just that that's, that that's not the way to deal uh, with, um, with, with uh, atrocities. It's not the way to deal with, with massacres. It's, it's inhuman, and you're dehumanizing people when you do that. And remember Johnny uh, talking about uh, some of the words that we're describing uh, Palestinians uh, from some Israeli uh, politicians and Johnny was saying that uh, you know once you're dehumanizing people uh, you know it's a very very difficult thing to support so that's always been that part of it that response has always been difficult for me to support but it's just gotten a lot worse lately because of this famine business and you could be quoting Oxfam or you could be quoting UNICEF you could be quoting a number of serious organizations dealing with hunger you could be doing dealing with talking about the Mennonite Central Committee which is uh, based uh, in, in, in the town that's become my adopted hometown, the one I'm in right now in Manitoba. And the fact is, and this is a fact, that people are starving. And this starvation, this famine, 
or the about to be famine is man-made. This is manufactured. And Netanyahu's hands are not clean here. Uh, you cannot, you cannot deliberately starve people. And it doesn't matter how angry you are about what's gone on. And I just uh, mentioned in the column, you know, uh, my, my hopes for the children of Palestine specifically, you know, I hope they become nourished and I hope it becomes, it happens very, very soon. And I simply said that I do not want you to go hungry because some of your kin murdered mine. But the, the response to October 7th and the response to the Holocaust is not to create bloodbaths. It is not to manufacture famine. It is not to kill uh, mothers and children. That's not a response. And I guess in some religious communities, uh, people uh, do not want to criticize any member or any religious communities, heritage communities, whatever you want. Albertans sometimes don't want to publicly criticize Albertans outside of Alberta. And it's entirely possible that some Jewish people don't want to criticize other Jewish people. Uh, but uh, to not criticize Netanyahu and to not criticize this sick uh, policy uh, that it has nothing to do with Judaism, it has nothing to do with Judeo-Christian values. Over the years, I asked various scholars, not just on my shows, but in my private life, uh, some were Jewish, some were uh, Christian, some were, were Catholic. Uh, the point is, I consulted them on the idea of an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, because all of them, of course, subscribe uh, to uh, both New and Old Testaments. Uh, to them, all of it is the word of God. And I wanted to ask them, and there was consensus. So I got consensus from Roman Catholics, from Protestants, from Jews, scholars, that eye for an eye, tooth for tooth is all about proportional punishment. If someone takes your tooth, you don't take their eye. All right? That's not what you do. And what's happening right now in Gaza is not proportional. It's not Jewish. It's not Judeo-Christian. It is a war against, I'm going to use my, my words cautiously here. It is a war on humanity, which is very, very close to calling it a war crime. To, call it a, to have it a war crime, it has to be investigated by people who investigate these things, including some great Canadians. But it, it's, it's time to think seriously about that. And uh, for anyone to attach themselves to someone who may be propagating war crimes, I'm sorry, that doesn't work. I don't care whether you're Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Catholic, agnostic, atheist. If you care about humanity, you have to care about the children of Palestine. Beautifully said, Charles, and so true. Uh, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, speaking just a couple of days ago, said the hunger crisis we're watching unfold in Gaza is striking in part for its uh, sheer severity. This is the highest number of people facing catastrophic hunger ever recorded by the Integrated Food Security Classification System, which we just referenced, anytime, anywhere, says the UN Secretary General. Uh, we are, quote, about to witness the most intense famine since World War II, uh, says Professor Alex DeWall at Tufts University, uh, writing in The Guardian on Thursday. This is on a uh, the IPC measures food insecurity on a five level scale. This is level five. Uh, they say 95 percent of Gazans are at phase three or higher. I mean, kids don't care about what phase they're in. Kids care about the fact that they haven't eaten and that uh, they're seeing people die around them. And it's uh, a horrific scenario. And uh, I'm grateful that you're using uh, your column inches, Chuck, to write about it in the Winnipeg Free Press. People can subscribe and find it online. We'll link to it in the show notes as well. It's a column I never wanted to write. Uh, I'm not discussing it on uh, many platforms in this country, but I trust you. Uh, I always have. And um, you've always been wonderful. And I, I love you very much. Charles Adler joins us the first episode of every week. That feeling is mutual. We love you too, pal. And uh, we'll be off next Monday for Easter. So that means we'll talk to you on a Tuesday. Have a happy Easter. Yeah, you as well, my man. Charles Adler. Find him online at Charles Adler. I appreciate that reference back to what you were talking about when, when he and I spoke previously. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think we knew that was coming. Like that's something, yeah. you know, this show... Uh, I mean, this is the hardest subject we've talked about, I think, in the last... Feels like it. 
six months. And I think we were all horrified on October 7th. But like Charles said, this is way past that now. This is starving to death is is the worst way to die. It's slow. It's painful. It's this is like this. And I like how Charles was comfortable or uh, was trying to be safe, you know, in his in his tone and the way he speaks. But this is this is very close to war crimes. I don't think the world can watch this happen much longer without everyone being in agreement on on what's happening here right and yeah I, i'm trying to be careful the way i speak as well well i mean i, I this guess is just yes and this no. is way past but i don't know that we have to be that careful i mean i understand what people want to say because you don't want to come across, because we're, we are so polarized mm -hmm. uh but let me just say you know you can feel safe more safe here than on any other radio station you've ever worked at any other sure. tv station you're ever going to work at uh you know and uh, but that should say but, something but when I we're, we're struggling to find the we're right in words. a position right now because if you say like l let the let the palestinians eat let the people in in northern Gaza, let the people in gaza Basic. eat uh you know you, you know and then people say like oh well, what about the hostages well yeah and release the hostages, you know, and or, or you know, it's you know, I mean, there's there are uh, obviously initiatives now calling for ceasefires, a UN Security Council resolution uh, calling for a Gaza ceasefire, the U.S. abstaining from that vote. Uh, you know, people sort of want you to pick a side, and we've talked about this a lot on the show. How uh, you know, you you can be horrified by what happened uh, on October seventh, and you can be horrified at what's happening uh, to innocent people, in particular children, but still innocent people. Uh, in Gaza and in the region. And I think that, you know, we will continue to, to make space for those important and common sense conversations that all come back to and that focus on our collective humanity. Let us never forget our collective humanity. And let's also not forget that we sit in, in, in a pretty privileged position here talking about famine, talking about hunger, knowing that for the most part, uh, with respect to, to, to the millions of Canadians that are grappling with an affordability crisis right now, but knowing for the most part that we will be able to feed our children tonight. Um, there was that horrible story. I don't have the details in front of me. I won't get too into it, but a horrific story within the last couple of weeks uh, when when troops essentially opened fire on unarmed Palestinian civilians because they were swarming uh, and the perception was there and, and maybe, maybe there was a obviously a breakdown in judgment or communication, but they were swarming delivery trucks, trucks that were delivering food aid. And so people were like mowed down and it's just a horrific circumstance. And then you try to get in the mind of someone, uh, a mom or a dad or an older brother or sister that's trying to compete for, for scarce food resources against hundreds of thousands or millions of other starving people. And you just, it, the whole thing is just absolutely brutal. Hayes Brown is a, a writer and editor at MSNBC Daily and uh, wrote something really powerful. Uh, you can find the full opinion piece at, at msnbc.com. Uh, but Hayes writes, history has shown us that the famines no longer simply happen, as so many would still assume. They are caused or exacerbated. This is what makes this entirely man-made crisis all the more tragic. It is not merely that there is enough food to feed the millions who are affected, nor that there is no drought that is causing people to starve in the desert. It is that with its choices and actions, Israel is helping cause a famine that will not help it win this war, but only amplify its suffering. The solution is clear, writes Hayes Brown. Let the people of Gaza eat. I mean, not giving someone food, that, that's, that, that's a war crime, no matter how you want to put it. People getting mad at me right here in the chat because I said close to war crimes. What I meant is I don't want to say what is and isn't. This has been going on so long. The UN identifies, the, the Human Rights Council identifies what it thinks it thinks are war crimes one way or another. I, I did. I just don't want to say because that's Listen, not my it's place. not up to us it's or our live place. chat to determine what, what's a war crime and what's not. I think we can, the, the whole point of this is that we can agree that children are starving in Gaza and that the global community needs to do something about that and, and, and pull the levers that it can and exercise yes. those options. Yes. And Israel, I think, uh, at some point is going to need to heed the position that the global community is taking here. Uh, you can always, again, if you, know, you want to get mad at Johnny in the chat or you can send <laughs> us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com.
Tom, let us know where you're landing on this. Where's your head at on this? Um, obviously open to different perspectives, but but this one seems like a no-brainer to me. Uh, we have a, a really uh, encouraging note to share with you. It's a tradition uh, every single week. In just a second, that's coming up uh, from a past guest, as a matter of fact, which we're going to feature in Positive Reflections. But we did just touch on the fact with Charles that Easter is upon us. It's coming up this weekend. If you don't yet have a plan in place for how you're going to feed your family, your friends, your visitors, are you hosting? Are you entertaining? Let Catering by Friesen Brothers handle the hard work so you can enjoy the fellowship. Customize your Easter dinner with their Easter dinner box. Friesen Brothers has a perfect solution for you to treat your family and friends to a special personalized Easter dinner this year. It all starts with the staples. It starts with the classics. You've got that traditional sliced gammon ham, roasted pineapple glaze, roasted garlic parmesan, baby potatoes, and in my mind, the star of the show, the honey dill carrots, plus a wide variety of add-ons you can customize your dinner from Granny's Famous Stuffing, BLT Potato Salad, and of course their iconic sourdough hot cross buns and more. It all starts with a visit to catering by Friesen.com slash Easter dinner. Get your order in today so you make sure it's there ready for pickup. All you do is pop it in the oven and boom, there you go. And if you're looking to transform your outdoor space to bring it to life, your front yard, your backyard, or both, and you want that work done in time to enjoy it this summer, I'm telling you, you got to get in touch with Eden Landscaping today. You'll find them online at landscapeedmonton.ca. You can learn more about what they do to elevate your landscaping project. Their team of designers, unbelievable listeners. They can take your vision. They'll take your budget into consideration. They'll come up with a plan. It's really neat. Once they get the plan done, they do this 3D rendering. You can essentially walk through your yard and get a real clear understanding of what what the tree's going to look like there or what this flower bed could do. What's that retaining wall going to look like? How's this water feature going to integrate? And then, of course, once you sign off on that, the work begins. It all starts with a consultation with Eden Landscaping. You can get started today at landscapeedmonton.ca. Johnny, you remember back on, uh, I think it was uh, December 21st, I believe. It was one of our final shows of the year. And uh, we had Lou Jobs join us oh, in yeah. the studio. You remember this? And and Lou was in to talk to us about, about his journey. Uh, Lou uh, experienced life on the street, um, and he really got uh, uh, deep uh, talking to us about his uh, personal experience with homelessness and uh, ultimately – uh, losing his daughter, the, the losing the relationship with his daughter. Uh, we tweeted mm-hmm. about it on December 21st, him talking about that. There were warrants out for his arrest. Uh, he was struggling with maintaining his sobriety at that point. Uh, and he talked to us about losing that relationship with his daughter. Uh, I just got an email. And so why don't we fire up the opener here? Because this is a perfect inclusion for our weekly tradition. This is presented by our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy. Uh, You know Kubi, tops in the solar game. And every morning, they want us to start our week off right. Every Monday morning, or the first episode of every week, we celebrate humanity. We call it positive reflections. And sometimes they're, you know, funny animal videos. And sometimes they're stories of paying it forward. And and sometimes they're follow-ups on past episodes of the show so you can imagine how thrilled we were to get an email within the last 24 hours from our friend Lou Jobs who joined us on the show on December 21st and he says Jespo when I was on the show you 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 showed a picture of me and my two kids and I told you you learned how I lost my daughter and I told you that that was the last time I saw her and then he writes dot 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 until yesterday Lou sent us a couple amazing photos, and we want to show these to you. Lou says now she's 18 years old. She graduates this year, and she is a beautiful young woman. Lou says, I just wanted to share with you and Real Talkers that we found each other. And that's it. That's where he left the email. But all I can tell you is I got chills up my spine when I opened the email. I'm getting chills up my spine now. I don't know the circumstances of them meeting up, but they have reconnected. This is a wonderful story, a good news story. And it just goes to show that things can always 
turn around. Lou, congratulations. I think you can see it on my face, which hurts from smiling. We are so thrilled that you have reconnected with your daughter and that you are using your life experiences to help the rest of us better understand some of the issues that people are facing, the miles that people are walking in their shoes. Lou, thank you for the courage that you showed joining us on the show on December 21st, talking about homelessness through a first-hand experience lens, talking about sobriety, talking about reconnecting to your culture. Lou, we applaud you and we're thrilled that you and your daughter have found each other again. If you have something in your personal life that you think would be a perfect fit for positive reflections, send us a note to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Make sure that you punch positive reflections into the subject line of the email. And don't forget, it's proudly presented by Kubi Renewable Energy. You can get your free solar quote today at kubienergy.ca. Want to let you know. So that's Tuesday. We're going to sit down in studio with the guy that wants to be the leader of the Alberta NDP. It's not Nahed Nenshi, it's Gil McGowan, a labor leader. What does his uphill climb look like? We'll find out. we got some straight shooting questions for him. On Wednesday, we're going to go live to Ukraine. We're going to learn more about what Albertans are doing over there. We're not forgetting about Ukraine. And on Thursday, Max Fawcett says that inflation is actually kind of the provincial government's fault. He'll make his argument right here on Real Talk. We'll see you then. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks. General manager, Katie Cook-Chivers. Account coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human resources, Lena Shepard. Website.